Hello and welcome back to another episode of Edward Chats. Today you're, uh, you're joined by me, Akhil Randhenia, and our esteemed guest today, Mr. Prabhat Vikram Singha. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about renewable energy in Sri Lanka, the generation of it, and how it works, and basically help everyone understand how renewable energy in Sri Lanka also uh, works. Uh, so let me give you a bit of a background on our esteemed guest today. Uh, so Mr. Vikram Singha started his career as an electrical engineer graduating from the University of Peradeniya in 1999. Uh, Mr. Prabhat has accumulated experience in renewable energy sec in the renewable energy sector for more than 22 years. Before starting up his own journey, he was working in the CEB affiliated Lanka Transformers Limited and then a multinational conglomerate of Haley's uh, from 2000 to 2009. And um, currently, Mr. Vikram Singha presently serves in the capacity of managing director, director, CEO, general manager in many renewable energy companies in countries such as Sri Lanka and the Sub-Saharan Africa. He is also active in many renewable energy associations and holds positions in the committee of in the capacity of president, secretary, committee member, and member. So thank you, Mr. Prabhat, for joining us today. Um, so let's start off. Um, I think a lot of us are unaware of how renewable energy uh, works in Sri Lanka. Um, I think uh, I speak for the mass audiences um, of the public when I say that, uh, yes, we are aware of uh, solar and a little bit of hydro, but um, I don't think a lot of us are aware as to how the extent of how renewable energy in Sri Lanka impacts our grid and the generation of it. Could you speak to that a bit? Yes. Uh, thank you, Akila, first of all, for giving me this opportunity to join you. Uh, so, uh, in Sri Lanka, the renewable energy uh, started way back in 1940s. Uh, and uh, even before that, when uh, during uh, the British uh, uh, regime that uh, they started off uh, a small hydro for uh, powering the tea plantations. Okay. Uh, so it's a very old industry in Sri Lanka, but uh, the modern renewable energy industry started in uh, 1996 uh, after the very first uh, privately owned mini hydropower project was started in Dikoya okay. by a gentleman called uh, Mr. Prema Siri So uh, this was a one megawatt uh, hydropower plant which supplied electricity to the national grid. Uh, since uh, then, uh, many mini hydropower plants came up in the central mountains and on the southern slopes and today by 2023 we have close upon 450 megawatts of uh, renewable mini hydro uh, capacity uh, spanned over 225 power plants so that is the story about uh, mini hydro and when it comes to solar power mm -hmm. uh, solar power is a more of a modern renewable energy yeah. And uh, in Sri Lanka, it was first started in uh, 2010 as okay. small rooftop projects. Okay. And in 2015, uh, then government had an aggressive plan to develop rooftop solar. Yes. So with that, they introduced uh, net metering, net accounting and net plus schemes. Right. Uh, with that, uh, actually, there was rapid growth. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we have rooftop solar capacity close to 600, 700 megawatts. Uh, and I think close to 35,000 installations all around Sri Lanka okay. in small scale houses, small and medium businesses, uh, large factories, hotels, banks, likewise. So if you look at wind power, uh, the first ever uh, IPP, uh, independent power produce of wind power started in 2008. This was, uh, uh, I think, three 10 megawatt power plant. Uh, and. Uh, this also had a journey, but not as uh, aggressive or developing as hydro or solar. And today we have privately owned uh, around 150 megawatts of wind power. Okay. Uh, I think 175 megawatts of wind power. Uh, but I have to mention also that uh, Ceylon Electricity Board um, commissioned a large wind power project in Mana, I think two years ago. Uh, this is also working well now. Uh, so altogether, wind power capacity in Sri Lanka now is around uh, 200, 275 megawatts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So apart from these three main forms, that is mini hydro, solar and uh, wind, we also have biomass. Yes. Uh, we have few uh, power plants which we burn uh, wood mm -hmm. uh, and chips uh, yeah. to make uh, energy. So there are around, I think, 50 megawatt capacity okay. in that as well. 
So, uh, in a like a brief summary, this is uh, how the sector developed over the last. Right. So, I guess renewable energy has always had its place in Sri Lankan uh, power generation. Um, I think, like you said, from the start uh, of our generation uh, of electricity as a whole, um, and going back to even the colonial times. Um, now, Mr. Vikram Singh, if I am to ask you for what exactly would the breakdown be in terms of uh, between fossil fuels and renewable energy and how does that split look like in Sri Lanka because I think a lot of us are um, very aware of when certain power stations shut down and those cause you know a lot of day-to-day -day daily activity inhibitions. Um, so what exactly is the per percentage breakdown if I can say of uh, generation of electricity in comparison okay. to pure fossil fuels? Let me show you a slide. Uh, I think if the viewers can see it now. Uh, so here I am presenting you the Sri Lanka electricity mix for 2023. Uh, our total requirement of electricity is around 16.8 terawatt hours. Um, and it breaks down to around 45 to 46 gigawatt hours per day. Okay. So out of this 16.8 uh, terawatt hours, uh, I think the largest contributor uh, is... Uh, presently diesel and heavy fuel with around 35% and coal contributes uh, for around 30% of it. Large hydro contributes by around 22% and renewable, all forms of renewable that is mini hydro, wind, solar, biomass, everything collectively contributes around 14 to 15%. Right. So what I want to um, like highlight here is that uh, although we talk a lot about renewables, uh, our contribution, contribution to the national grid uh, by way of modern renewable is only 14 to 15 percent even after 25 years. You can see that uh, there's a big dominance by the coal and diesel and heavy fuel which is close upon 60 to 65 percent of the total generation. Okay, Mr. Vikram Singh. So, now speaking about renewable uh, energy, as we can see, you know, depending on heavy fuel and uh, non-renewable energy sources, uh, left us a bit of a sour taste because it's very dependent on like economic situation of the state. Absolutely. Um, so, um, in comparison to fossil fuels, renewable energy sources, what would the breakdown be in terms of uh, cost Cost to generate, uh, at least in the present year? Yeah. Now, I'm, uh, I will show you another, another slide. Now, if you look at the costs, uh, now, uh, in, in the previous slide, you saw that the large hydro... Uh, has 22% contribution, but you know this water comes free because of that there is no fuel cost. Right. It's basically zero. Uh, but in case of uh, if you take coal, uh, this would uh, like uh, need around uh, 92 billion or close to 100 billion rupees for coal imports. This is because uh, in 2023 the coal prices have come down. Okay. Uh, if you look at last year, when we bought coal, I think the coal metric ton was about $200. But right now, the international prices are around $150 per metric ton. Uh, still, we need around $100 billion to buy our coal for this year. And uh, the biggest uh, problem is the diesel and heavy fuel. Uh, for this, we need around $500 billion uh, to uh, you know, uh, supply this 35% uh, uh, energy requirement. And uh, for renewables, actually, CB is paying a very moderate uh, price of around 15 to 16 rupees per each unit average. Okay. So this is the monetary value of around 36 billion. Okay. So you will see here that uh, although the contribution is 60 to 65 percent from coal and diesel and heavy fuel, 80 percent of the CB revenue goes to uh, coal importation of yeah. this uh, fuel. So uh, this reliance on like imports has a massive pressure on US dollar uh, where we have a dollar scarcity uh, because uh, electricity being an essential uh, commodity, uh, it can uh, topple governments if you uh, stop generating. Yeah, it, yeah. it happened. Uh, yes, yeah, like we saw. Yeah, you saw it, right? Uh, to allow a power cut uh, to call the people to the streets. And uh, so it is an essential commodity and uh, government is obliged uh, to supply at any cost. Yes. So, uh, so heavy reliance on 
uh, coal and uh, diesel and heavy fuel uh, is is uh, is a negative uh, makes a very neg negative impact to the national economy yes as we clearly saw um so now that we've established that uh, we have we have renewable energy sources in sri lanka and we have a you know thriving uh, renewable energy uh, generation sector so how productive or how probable is it for us to depend more on renewable energy in terms of the demands uh, to be met by the grid and uh, you know the yearly demands and the daily demands uh, what what can we speak to about that mr Prabhu? yeah so um, yeah i will show another slide to you here you can see uh, our renewable energy mix yes uh, in this uh, out of i think this is the energy mix we are predicting for 2024 so mini hydro uh, although we have uh, right now we have 450 megawatts but uh, in sri lanka there is capacity to easily to add another 2 to 300 megawatts right. right so the speciality in mini hydro is that it runs in the night unlike solar okay. now if you look at solar power uh, basically it starts when the sun starts in the morning and it goes down uh, in the evening right. but if you look at mini hydro it runs in the night and it supplies much needed electricity for the peak where the Sri Lankan peak start at six, six o'clock in the evening and goes up to 10 o'clock in the evening. Right. So mini hydros run during that time. So it's a very good replacement for uh, uh, like fuel based uh, power plants. So we can uh, easily add another two to 300 megawatts of mini hydro on top of the present 450 megawatts. Right. If you look at rooftop solar right now, we are around 700 megawatts. I think uh, this is a big potential and uh, it adds a lot of value to the national economy but uh, because uh, the money goes into the households people uh, small and medium scale businessmen so uh, it develops a parallel economy right. so in rooftop solar very easily we can go up by another thousand megawatts but there are problems and this is why uh, this is not uh, increasing the way we want mm -hmm. especially i think uh, with the economic collapse last year uh, the dollar went up and uh, there were import controls. So okay. uh, people could not, or the vendors did not have money to import solar modules and uh, accessories. So because of that, there was a, uh, like a decrease in the growth. Okay. Uh, but now with the restrictions slowly like uh, coming out, I hope uh, next year we will add another few hundred megawatts of rooftop solar, uh, maybe next year and year after. If you look at wind power, uh, right now, privately owned wind power plants are on 175 megawatts, and we have CB large power plant, uh, which is 100 megawatts. Now, uh, Sri Lanka, because of its uh, geographical position, uh, is one of the best wind sites in the whole world. Right? If, if you look at Mana and Northern Peninsula, uh, we have the best wind sites. So this is why I think the geopolitics are now playing in and uh, our neighbor and the companies are uh, interested in doing very large wind power plants okay. in Sri Lanka. Uh, so in this context, I think uh, as a renewable energy developer and a person from the industry, we have no objection uh, for multinational companies coming in and with FDIs uh, mm -hmm. like investing in Sri Lanka. But um, we also need to look at the local developers who has the technical competence and who have done projects in the past. Uh, so when a very large scale project is given uh, to a foreign company uh, without following any competitive bidding process, uh, this does a lot of injustice to the local developers. So uh, this needs to be looked at uh, by the policymakers and by the politicians and come to some compromise. Otherwise, the local industry will vanish. Right. And uh, although the mere concept of renewable energy is to save money in Sri Lanka, but a foreign company taking the profits away uh, will then uh, basically, uh, that, that concept will not be there. Right, right. It definitely doesn't make sense uh, if we are pushing out the local industry. Right. Local industry. Of, uh, international so finally, uh, ground-mounted solar, uh, I think we have very low development in that, okay. only around 160 megawatts, but this also have a massive potential. Not as much as rooftop solar, but easily we can develop another uh, thousand megawatts in the next 10 years or so. Uh, you need to understand that, uh, I mean, if you look at other countries who has done well in ground-mounted solar, like if you look at India, 
they have huge power plants in Rajasthan desert, which the land cannot be utilized for something else. So it's best for solar power because land doesn't have economic value. Okay. But in Sri Lanka, this is not the case. So uh, in everywhere in Sri Lanka, we can grow something in most of the parts, right? right? And most of the land are irrigated lands and right. we have uh, abundant rainfall. So therefore, selecting these sites, we have to be careful because there is an opportunity cost. For instance, if I put up a roof, a ground mounted solar power plant by removing a tea estate, uh, I mean, tea also brings a lot of foreign income. Right, and it also has its own economy of its own. Right? Absolutely. So uh, these are the things that we need to look into when you put up ground mounted solar. Um, so I would like to go through the four, uh, four renewable energy sources that you were talking about. And let's try to dissect as to what is exactly holding back investment or development in terms of um, uh, the renewable energy sources. So if you look at mini hydro, Mr. Prabhat, what could you, if you could pinpoint it to a couple of things that are restricting development or um, opening up of these markets, um, what exactly is preventing mini hydro? Because we know rooftop solar, there was a lot of issues with um, the government state, uh, the CEB, especially to pay back um, to providers, customers, uh, essentially, who were generating power and providing back to the grid. And there was a lot of disincentive for people to also take upon rooftop solar. And that's one issue. And I think that's something a lot of us are aware about. But let's talk about mini hydro and wind. Um, and since you did speak about ground mounted solar, you know, and how it's a bigger, it's a more industrial uh, uh, industrial source. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, opportunity costs that come with land and whatnot in Sri Lanka. Um, so can we touch upon wind for a second? Yeah. So uh, in general, Akila, uh, for all these three sectors, there is a fundamental uh, thing that we require here in Sri Lanka. It is a consistent government policy. Okay. Uh, if I elaborate on that, uh, see, these are serious long-term projects. And uh, investor or entrepreneur who invests in a mini hydro or wind or ground-mounted solar has to operate the plant for 20 years. Yeah. Right? Um, so, of course, uh, when there are serious economic downturns, devaluation of the currency, so uh, and uh, uh, government put restrictions on expectation of profits. Yes. Uh, so these uh, will adversely impact, uh, especially after coming out of uh, economic uh, collapse, uh, will impact the future uh, interest to do right. come into this project. So one is, of course, we need to have consistent government policy. Uh, then. Another one is how we safeguard these investors by giving uh, the Board of Investment uh, tax waivers, import tax waivers, income tax and uh, dividend tax, whatever possible ways for them to maximize their return. Uh, because you have to, I, I think the policy makers will have to always think on the perspective that uh, if you do not do renewable, it has to be replaced by fossil fuel, right? So it takes out uh, dollars out of Sri Lanka. Uh, so, these are the general things. So, third general thing is tariff. Yeah. Now, uh, it links to the government policy as well. Uh, so, if government decides that, okay, we are going for competitive bidding for these projects, they have to practice it. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you can't do competitive bidding two years and then maybe a government change and the new set of politicians come and they will say, no, now we are going to do... Um, uh, feed-in tariff right. uh, and after some time they change it again and they will say no no we are going for competitive so right. this sort of changes will only distract okay. and take away investors from this right. so the fourth point is general for all this is again uh, paying these projects on time yeah, yeah? so especially in a situation where the interest rates skyrocketed to 30 30 30 percent interest and when cb is not paying and uh, all these projects are up to 75, 70% funded by banks. So how are the investors or shareholders finding money to service the bank loans? Yeah. So most of the uh, like uh, owners of these projects, which I know, uh, they, they carry a brand name in, in the industry. Okay. So uh, when the CB is not paying, some people like uh, they put their own cash uh, sometimes they, you know, sell some land or, you know, do something and they 
they service the bank loan, otherwise they go into non-performing right. and your name goes into crib. Right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think the policy makers, CEB and the ministry uh, and the politicians need to have, uh, they have to be sensitive for these issues. Uh, because right now, uh, we were discussing before that uh, the delay in payment is still around uh, 10 months. So when you are not paid for 10 months and you are still operating, paying salaries of the people, spare parts, paying the banks, capital and interest. So how do you survive? Right. I think it's a miracle that we all are surviving right now. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So th th this is the fourth point. So basically you have to pay on time. Uh, so that's the third one. And going more specifically into uh, ground mounted and wind power, uh, uh, my personal view is that uh, these projects needs to be tendered uh, in a very transparent way to get the best tariff. Right. Uh, and also, sites have to be located uh, without, you know, utilizing economically agriculture-based feasible lands. Uh, I mean, there are lands that could be used for wind power and solar power in Sri Lanka. Th th those lands could be used. Okay. Uh, and to give, uh, give benefit or give entrance to the local developers, uh, the sizes of these projects will have to be, I would say, moderate. For instance, uh, if the government floats a 100 or 200 megawatt solar park, how many Sri Lankans or Sri Lankan companies can bid for that? They don't have the financial muscle. Okay. But without going for 100 megawatt, they can go for 25 into 4 also. No? Sure. Yeah. 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 So, and break it up into yeah, local so that developers. Local or foreign developers will then equally participate in these right. projects. Right. So these are the some of the barriers uh, I wanted okay. to discuss uh, for this session. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Prabhat. Uh, and just to our audience in general, um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel them to us in the chat, and we'll do our best, uh, both Mr. Prabhat and I, to answer any questions we, uh, that you may have. And also do do not forget to follow us on all our social media and also to support us wherever possible. Um, so, Mr. Prabhat, you spoke about the inability of investors to recover their investments because of non-timely payments by CEB. However, recently we saw that with the electricity tariff hike um, and you know no lo it no longer being subsidized uh, to a certain extent and there was a cost-effective pricing. Um, and we saw that uh, I think I believe recently in the news it was said that uh, CEB had just started servicing a 10-year-old uh, loan that they had taken, uh, an international loan. Um, so how has the cost-effective pricing of CEB, how has that worked in the mix of renewable energy and has that made things better? Yeah, I think a very good question. Akila, you know, why CEB ran into losses was, uh, you know, because of some historical mistakes okay. the policymakers and the politicians did in the past. Now, for instance, uh, in 2014, when we commissioned the Lakhuja coal power plant, uh, the electricity tariffs were like reduced by 25%. Uh, I, I, I don't know that you could remember, maybe you were a small boy at that time. So in 2014, there was a thing called fuel surcharge of 25%, uh, which was taken out. Uh, and since 2014, up to 2022, uh, no uh, government or no policymaker uh, touched the tariff. It remained at that price for seven years. Okay, so it's flat. It, 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 it did not change. Okay. So at the meantime, the cost was going up. So this created uh, massive imbalances in the cash flows of CB, and finally, they could not pay the renewables, they could not pay the fossil fuel, they could not import the coal, and yeah. you know, so many things happened. Yeah. Uh, so one thing the present government and the present minister did was, was brave enough that came out and uh, made it cost reflective, okay. right? So then the market forces take over. So it's a dynamic tariff which will change uh, every six months based on the cost. Uh, and of course, with the IMF funding now, uh, I think it has to be like that for the coming years as well. It's a condition. So this will help the utility to run without incurring losses, right? But at the meantime, you have to look at the consumers, okay. right? Because costs will always, because especially when you are uh, generation mix, or mix is more dominated by fossil fuel. Every time the dollar, the rupee becomes weakened, yes. you have to pay more for your imports. Yes. Uh, so
So to balance this, one good way is to go for renewables because renewables has a rupee tariff and it has no link to uh, like US dollar on long term. Um, and also CB restructuring is being discussed right now. Yes, that's another thing I wanted to ask you about. So uh, of course, with a private management and with private ownership, uh, they will more closely look at the financial health of that organization and uh, because the owners, uh, if it's a listed or like private owned, uh, they would uh, want to make a return. Definitely, yes. So obviously, uh, the prices uh, will have a tendency to go up okay. uh, unless they change, they attempt to change the generation mix. Right, and that would be to include more renewables and uh, reduce, if possible, uh, the dependency on fossil fuels and coal. Yes. Um, so, speaking of CEB restructuring um, and the past of it now, we all know that in 2002, 2003, with the Electricity Act, that there was a lot of um, operational restructuring within the CEB, you know, breaking down internally. Are making it a, at least attempting to make it a bit more efficient in its uh, workflow. Mr. Prabhat, could you speak to how, what you could predict, because we are still uncertain about what restructuring would look like and what would be the most favorable outcome for renewable? Because you've established that renewable is the way forward. There is um, no two words about that. Um, but in your opinion, as someone who's experienced in the sector, what would be favorable uh, to the renewable energy sector? Yeah. So there'll be a lot of pressure from public for a tariff hike, consumer tariff hike. Right. Uh, people will come into streets. So uh, because of this, uh, of course, the new owners of uh, the utility uh, will have to think of new ways of reducing their generation cost. Right. So that is one best way is to bring renewable into the picture. Uh, also, um, being a state-run organization for the last I don't know, 75 years or so. Uh, you know, uh, every time a government changes, a new uh, politician who gets appointed as a power minister puts people from his village to the uh, cadre of CB. Uh, so these things will stop. Yeah. Uh, so they will look at more um, HR efficiency, uh, human efficiency. Yep, yeah. definitely. We have a lot of inefficiencies. Inefficiencies. At the uh, and also, uh, there will be uh, like, uh, you know, there are losses in the transmission distribution. Right. Uh, so they will try to basically rehabilitate these networks and reduce the losses. Uh, and uh, on the distribution, uh, also there's a big loss around maybe up to nine or eight percent of the total generation is lost in distribution. Right. Okay. Uh, so they will uh, find ways to reduce these losses right. okay. and new investments will come in. Uh, because they, they will look it in a more proactive way and efficient way, I, I, I suppose. But uh, also, I have to tell you, Akila, restructuring cannot make your energy cost 50% less. Okay. Yeah. 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 We have to be realistic. <laughs> we have to be those. realistic. I mean, if someone thinks that, okay, now I am paying 50 rupees for each unit, after restructuring, I will pay 25, which will not happen. Okay. So, uh, because already it is a relatively uh, well-run organization. Uh, you can um, maybe increase its efficiency by another 5% or maximum 10% and reduce the loss by another 5%. So yeah, basically, uh, I mean, you can't hope miracles to happen. Uh, but long term, uh, government will be relieved because otherwise the treasury will have to pump in money every year to see the losses. Like yeah, so this now. will basically relieve the government and uh, it will create, uh, uh, I mean, the most modern technology can also come in. Uh, renewable energy can uh, play a big role okay. with the restructuring. So um, to finish, restructuring will go in uh, mainly in the distribution and the transmission. Right. Uh, so the generation, we would not know still how, whether they are going to privatize the already operational power plants, which I think, uh, uh, there's no no meaning to that. Okay. Yeah, but uh, transmission and distribution uh, could be the start. Right, those are the two places that you will find uh, to be of most use uh, in terms of restructuring. 
Um, so thank you so much, Mr. Prabhat, for joining us today and helping us understand, at least me personally, um, understanding how much of an impact we, the renewable energy sector has in Sri Lanka. Um, like I said at the start, uh, we all assume renewable energy in Sri Lanka at least to be limited to um, rooftop mountain solar systems and, you know, a bit of wheeling in, uh, in the terms of mini hydro uh, stations. But I think you helped us all understand that, first of all, I mean, we hear it all the time, but it's easier to, when it's grounded of how important renewable energy and the development of that sector is in Sri Lanka and how much, um, how independent it will make our state or release the burden on the treasury, the government sector, um, and as well as uh, policymakers as well. Um, so for that, I thank you very much. Um, and I'm pretty sure our audience was also enlightened with what you had to say. And to our audience, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today. And once again, if you have any more questions, please feel free to drop them in our social media uh, outlets. And also don't forget to support us. Because if you have any questions, we are more than willing to answer them. And if it is a complicated, loaded question, then we are also able to make explainers to help other people understand as well. So, Mr. Prabhat, thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, and to our viewers, thank you so much. If you are interested in seeing more content like this, don't forget to like, subscribe and follow Advocata on all social media platforms to never miss out on our latest content. Consider supporting Advocata by becoming an individual subscriber. Gain access to our weekday media monitoring of economic news, exclusive Advocata events and more. To learn more, visit us at support.advocata.org.